So I want I want to keep going. I wanted to make sure and talk about the Title IX stuff. Okay. And but before we do, I'll just play. I don't know if it's devil's advocate quiet, but I'll just say that you know there's the argument to be made that this is a religious school that uh, it's a you know it's a church own school they've yeah. got the honor code yeah their game their rules mm-hmm. and um you could even argue that you weren't fully on plan like it, it's probably fair mm-hmm. to say that you weren't a literal believer in the one true church and exclusive priesthood authority by some point right yep that you were you were not just an orthodox but but maybe even um Maybe your beliefs were even threatening to to the church in in terms of if if the b- beliefs got around and spread, it could even do harm to the church. Maybe. Um, and so, if that's all true, then they have a right to get rid of who they want. And someone could also say, "Were you a wolf in sheep's clothing? Were you sort of benefiting from a, a church-run, church-financed institution?" Not as a fully, fully committed member, if not in deed, then at least in thought <laughs> or belief. Right. I'm just trying to explore the other side, and I talk as much or little as you want about those. It's not really a question, but it kind of is. Yeah. Do you get what I'm asking? Totally. So. The problem that I see with that argument is that what's really happening is your that argument places the blame on a human for going through what is an entirely natural human development, um, which is to come into your own uh, understanding of your relationship to the world around you and your spiritual life. Um, and so... Um, My response, there's so many ways I could respond to Take that. Take your time. And I don't want to respond to it in a way that validates that, actually. Um, I went through years of reclaiming in authentic ways uh, the, the symbols of Mormonism for myself. Uh, and... Um, And so in that sense, my connection to it was really authentic. I think it's a fair assessment that if I hadn't had BYU-Idaho, it's very possible I would have left at the time that Holly did. But I'm so unbelievably grateful that I did not. Because because of my own propensity for all or nothing thinking, which is the question that you posed, is the the assumption behind that question is all or nothing. Um, And so... For me, if I had held on to an all or nothing version of the world and if I had left, I think if I had left at the same time that Holly left, I would have been the same kind of black and white post-Mormon that I was a black and white Mormon. And neither one of those would have brought health or healing to me personally. And, um, And so I remain profoundly grateful that I was around the most extraordinary kind of people who... um, who were fully devoted to the church um, and who inspired me to be a better person. It made it so I could not just adopt a black and white narrative about the church itself or about my own journey. Um, And so the piece of that question that I want to push against is that all or nothing assumption um, because that only yields suffering. Um, And I think that... um, Uh, the process of growing into an adult version of spirituality. I, I now see, like, I feel like the black and white all or nothing is an adolescent version of spirituality. Um, and that the purpose of it is to grasp aggressively to certainty and rigidity and, and solidness, right? Even the metaphors that, that I used when I was, when that was my, 
spiritual life, the metaphors I used were like building on a rock, right? So that I could never fall. And like, it was all about rigidness and strength and standing up to, um, but now I feel like an adult version of spirituality is actually not about certainty and rigidity. It's actually about embracing uncertainty, embracing change, um, practicing being open to the, to, to that, to the reality and the, uh, of the, to the constant change that is life. And that's a different kind of spiritual practice than holding on to certainty. And, and it's a more painful one, uh, but it yields more empathy and it yields more compassion. And, um, and I feel like that's the direction. I'll just say it makes me really sad that there's a significant contingency of the members of my faith community who do and would see me that way because that means that this suffering will continue, that they will continue to fail to create spaces for creative um, spiritual growth. Um, as long as it's that cut and dry in their minds. So the other part that I would push against is the notion that faith is synonymous with belief. Um, beliefs are ideas that exist inside of our minds, <laughs> our dualistic bicameral minds. And, um, whereas to me, faith is an experience of one's relationship to everything, whether they frame that as divine or not. And there has to be an, until this community finds a way to make space for people to experience that growth towards embracing uncertainty towards then, then this suffering that I have experienced and that so many experience will continue to happen until we see those patterns and start to untie them. So it's a decision that you're, if someone were to level that at me kind of as you're playing devil's advocate, if you're absolutely right, it's, it's within the church's right to create a community like that. The question is whether it's in their best interest in the best interest of the people who love it and follow. And, um, and I would want to reframe it that way. Hmm. Um, there's a, I mentioned before that Mary Oliver's become really important to me. And one of the poems that she writes, she writes about a bird that sings and the, fr I can't remember word for, I wish I could remember word for word, the phrase, but it's something like, were, were he to suddenly be assaulted with answers, the song would stop. Mm -hmm. And that is where I am interested in going in my spiritual life and practice. I want to be the bird that sings uh, because of the questions. Mm. So, so that's a decision that the church, I think, is in the middle of making, whether they can create a space that allows for ambiguity and growth or whether they'll say, no, we need everyone to, you know, to use Mormon symbolism, the decision right now is, do we keep trying to stay in the garden or not? Mm -hmm. Right? Do we buckle down and say, no, we're staying in the garden no matter what, and anybody who leaves the garden is bad? Or do we take the step as a community into the majestic and wonderful, lone and dreary world? That's the question facing the community right now. That's my response. It's the best I can think of today anyways. Anything you want to add, Holly? I just enjoyed hearing you frame it that way. So I think, yeah, I think it's, yeah, healthy. And I, I wish for people to be able to have some more space. Because, you know, sometimes the LDS Church will fight against people saying that they're cookie cutter, uh, producing cookie cutter people. Um, and that was one thing that always bugged me when I would hear that. 
but for there not to be space for people to be able to be individuals. Anyway, there's just, it's just kind of like, um, two different, two sides of a sword, um, that you're an individual individual and your individuality is so important to God and to Christ and to the church, but it needs to fit into this. And I think, you know, yeah, so we, other people get hurt and there's not space and gosh, for salad is great <laughs> and it can <laughs> be eaten and enjoyed by people. And you know, anyway, yeah, that was great how you framed that. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> there's this, there's this idea that if things are flexible, they can bend and not break, but if they're too rigid, they'll break. And I'm sure the church and its leadership are always trying to walk that line of being open, being compassionate, being flexible, but not being so flexible that, that faith erodes. And so they're always trying to walk that line and they're always having to draw boundaries. And sometimes people get drawn in the boundaries and sometimes people get drawn out of the boundaries. And I, on the one hand, I feel upset that they're not more flexible and diverse and broad minded and so forth. Um, and then on the other hand, I just feel like I wouldn't want their job because, mm -hmm. because doubt and progressivism and feminism and LGBT love and support and, you know, uh, multiculturalism, they're all a virus that can spread and cause people to question prophetic authority and the church's truth claims, and they can kind of spoil Eden. And so I, I can understand the mentality of wanting to weed out progressives, to weed out questions, to weed out truth and science and feminism and progressivism and LGBT support, because it really can catch like a wildfire and, and burn up faith in, in large populations in a short amount of time. Am I wrong? Well, this is, I mean, I have some, I've been thinking a lot about that. And I think it only burns up faith if you've made the mistake of equating faith to belief one-to-one. -one. So I feel like the, there has been a tremendous amount of suffering in my, well, I'll just speak from my experience, that came out of growing up in the 90s, which may have been the most correlated version of Mormonism that got taught to a mm -hmm. generation, you know? Yeah, Bruce R. McConkie, yeah. Mormon doctrine. So, but the, the idea is... If if you embrace the idea that that the ideas you have are faith, then yeah, that's going to burn up, because those are going to be limited. They will continue to be limited, and they will uh, continue to fail us as we try to connect more with each other, and as we um, experience things that are not so all or nothing. And so, to me, that's the door. That, that, that could be taken meaningfully is loosening the grip of belief around the idea of faith and return faith to a realm of experience rather than one of ideas and have language support the experience rather than force experience to support the language and the ideas. Mm -hmm. So I think about that a lot, but I do think there's a door there and it doesn't, it only, it's only going to burn up if you've made that one-to-one. -one. Yeah. And then you're right. If you've put if you've put all your chips on the correct belief or in orthodoxy, right belief, right? If that's where you've put all your chips, you're right. That's going to burn up because life experience is so much bigger than that. So there needs to be a recentering, I think. And I actually think that the there's ample theological underpinning for that to happen within this faith tradition. But it's, it's the type of underpinning that Catholicism and Episcopalians and Lutherans and Presbyterians have all been down those roads. And I think those churches are, some would argue they're weaker if you define strength as butts and seats and, and tithing receipts, all those religions are kind of weaker for going down those roads. Then they're failing to produce experiences that feel compelling to people. Go, yeah. go find some brilliant musicians. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So. 
Okay, so I think the next part of this story is just to talk about your experiences with BYU exec, BYU Idaho executives and Title IX, and this probably should be its own episode. Are you ready to go there? Yeah. Do you need a break? Are you okay? I'm okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, let's jump in. Like, okay. Let's shift gears. Shifting gears. So give us some context because, and I'll just set this up a tiny bit. Um. You know, we've talked a lot about BYU over the years and specifically around the honor code and and the federal government. And, you know, uh, th- this has come into play not only over the past few years as LGBTQ BYU students have been impacted by changes to the honor code policy and enforcement, but also uh, sexual assault and rape. And we know that in, in, you know, the Salt Lake Tribune won like a Pulitzer prize for investigating the connections between the Provo police department, uh, the BYU honor code office, the BYU police department, the honor code office and bishops and state presidents and BYU, just the sharing of information of private things that bishops and state presidents and their counselors talk to about their students with BYU, BYU sharing things with bishops and state presidents, and then police getting involved and people getting raped or sexually assaulted, and somehow that getting in the hands of the honor code office or BYU, you know, bishops and state presidents, and some students getting kicked out because they confessed to rape, uh, you know, and then the women being blamed for being raped, and just a real nightmare that's led to significant changes in the BYU Honor Code, along with now protests around BYU's treatment of LGBTQ students and how that might lead to questions around federal grant money and support and the hireability of BYU students, you know, outside once they graduate, like a big mess. And so what's what's cool about this next segment is that uh, a lot of these sort of issues, you know, uh, sort of will be touched on because Ryan has had some experience with some of these interconnecting influences and then how BYU administration did and didn't handle these appropriately. Is that fair? Is there anything else you want to say as a setup, Ryan? No, I think that's fair. That's the context. Yeah. So, and that really is the context for what happened with my experience with this, because all of that that you just mentioned was going on right before these things happened. Uh, and so those many of the changes that you referenced had been made at BYU-Idaho as well as at BYU-Provo. So, um, so, um, so take us back. So I'll just say, um, as I started sharing my experiences with all the things we just talked about, just during my story of being pushed to the margins, other people started coming out and sharing their experiences with me. There's kind of this amazing thing that would happen that way is people would start seeking me out just to talk with me. And, um, and one of the things that started surfacing is that a lot of my um, female uh, colleagues um, from departments across campus um, would started to uh, trust me more with their stories of um, of being marginalized. And in many instances, those stories were really um, harrowing experiences with sexual misconduct at the hands of ecclesiastical leaders who were also had the power to endorse, to give them an endorsement. So this is one of the reasons they talked to me is that as I experienced my problems uh, and my powerlessness in, in an endorsement process, they shared with me their experiences of powerlessness in an endorsement process. And I need to be so careful. Um, several of, of these friends and colleagues of mine actually asked me to speak about these um, because they don't feel safe speaking about them because they're afraid that they will lose their jobs if they do. And that in and of itself is terrifying to me. Um, and just points to a real problem with the culture on campus at BYU-Idaho, that there would even be one person feeling this way would be huge, Um, that there are many is really concerning to me. So so the experiences, and I have to be, of course, so careful here, um, the experiences that my colleagues have shared with me uh, range from everything as 
as simple or as um, benign, and this is not benign, as a as a as a bishop joking with them about how it's too bad that polygamy is over because if if it wasn't, he'd sure have his eye on on them um, for one of the, his plural wives. I mean, the just. That's so objectifying. I can't imagine going to someone who's supposed to be a spiritual leader of mine and having them say that to me. Um, anyway, so everything from that to instances where um, bishopric members would grope them in inappropriate ways. Um, and um, or anyways, I, I need to be really careful about not sharing too many specifics, but true sexual harassment and sexual misconduct, e even including physical touching, um, that is just not okay at all. By bishopric uh, by members? By bishopric members to faculty colleagues of mine. Okay. Um, and since we're talking about Title IX, this also relates to other colleagues who, and female colleagues who throughout the hiring process had a variety of of really sexist um, questions asked by to them by executives at BYU Idaho in the hiring process, um, and so um, I, when all these stories came to me again, my I guess I'm just looking at it, talking about it to you today. I'm realizing I'm kind of a naive person, but I thought surely nobody knows about these things, and we just need to report them. And so there was a there was a concerted effort by the faculty association. Um, several members of the faculty collected pages and pages of experiences with the endorsement process in particular, but also included these issues with around sexual misconduct in the endorsement process. And it include some of uh, students too, because. You had mentioned I'm that I'm actually other... not. Um, okay. I haven't received permission to talk about that. I can say that there have been issues with students as well, um, but I haven't gotten permission from the people who experienced that to talk about that directly today. But yes, there these these issues absolutely applied to students as well. Um, it's and, that, and we just have to say it's such a position of authority because these bishops or bishopric members or stake presidents or stake presidency members determine one's continued employability. Yes. So there's this real catch-22 of what if you have an abusive bishop or stake president? What if, it can, what if they've hurt you or abused you in some way or assaulted you or harassed you? But then if you, if you call it to the attention, you're going up against the patriarchy. And even men, when they go up against the patriarchy, maybe especially men, when they go up against the patriarchy, they get smashed. <laughs> and so do you what? want to even try to go up against it when your job could be in jeopardy. And we, you know, we all want to assume that bishops and stake presidents and their counselors are all lovely, kind, compassionate people, and many of them are, but you get bad apples. Mm -hmm. And when you do get bad apples, they have a lot of power over you. Yep. It's not just your, your church membership and reputation community, it's your livelihood at this, at this point. Absolutely. Uh, and that's not hyperbole at all. That's absolutely the case. And um, so, um, so in addition to the faculty association report, another colleague of mine actually typed up a six-page single-spaced um, report detailing their experience with sexual misconduct. Um, and in the case of one of the more extreme cases, one of the executives ended up taking care of it themselves, um, kind of vigilante taking care of it and, and getting the, the ecclesiastical leader in question basically kind of sh you know, shuffling them out of town. Um, but no systemic changes were made of any kind to help prevent this from happening again uh, in the future. Um, and to be sure, um, I think the narrative that the executives want to believe is that these are just so rare that there's no need for a systemic institutional response. Um, but and and I think for sure, um, the majority of 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 leaders are not doing these things. Um, but even just one bad apple can affect hundreds, right? Um, and so, I, yeah, so. Um, so as I realized, so, so as these reports started going up, it came to our awareness that, um, that in fact they did know 
that these things were going on, or rather they had received these reports, um, uh, and that the Title IX office had passed these reports along to the executives. So and, let me just, so, so let's just say yeah. bishop, bishops or bishopric members had harassed or, or abused BYU-Idaho faculty or staff. Mm -hmm. That information had been passed on to executives at to BYU. To the Title IX Idaho. office who passed it on to the executives. And what does... What does, I don't even know if we can address this legally, but what does what a church leader does to one of its congregants have anything to do with, with the Title federal IX. Title IX? So the, the, the intersection here is that the purpose of Title IX is to, protect, is, to make, is to ensure equal access to educational opportunities regardless of gender, among other things. For faculty and staff as well as students or just um, students? There, well, this is one of the... This is, we're already about to the depth of my understanding of okay, yeah. legally, right? Right. And this is where when I, because I did report this to the Office of Civil Rights and they actually, they felt like this would be more an equal employment opportunity issue than a Title IX issue with regards to faculty. Um, that's, from what I've been able to research, that's actually not necessarily the case. Um, because we've received several trainings at UVU about Title IX, which has been a whole different experience around Title IX, because I have to pass training there every year just to stay on faculty with regards to Title IX, which is such a refreshing and wonderful thing. You like that? I love that. Yeah. Yeah, I want to be taught. I want to know how to... To, to do better. So I've loved those trainings. And, and in those trainings, they've actually said that title nine cases have applied to faculty as well as to students. So, okay. so, um, I guess it depends on who you talk to the person in the office of civil rights that I sent these concerns to seem to think that maybe it wasn't a title nine issue. And for that reason, it stopped short of having anything happen. But, um, so BYU Idaho executives are made aware are made of aware. bishops abusing faculty or staff and or harassing. Yeah, absolutely. And and, um, and nothing. What do you mean? No, no institutional response of any kind. The requests, unless unless those changes have been made since I left, which I just spoke with one of my colleagues over the weekend, and they assured me that changes had not been made. Um, uh, there was no institutional response to helping people in those situations have any recourse or a path to help or um, anything. And so we ended up having a department of music training session where the number two person in the title IX office came and gave us a training session. And I don't think that they realized how much we knew about this when they came to give this training. So um, maybe they were a little extra open with us than they would have otherwise been. But um, at one point in that training session, um, I, I was asking these kinds of questions, like, so the executives know about this, like, well, is there any training being done? Can the Title IX office train the bishoprics and the ecclesiastical leaders um, and help them understand what sexual misconduct is, right? If Even if we're going to say that maybe this is just ignorance uh, growing up in a, you know, the good old boys club in Southeast Idaho, how are they being trained to prevent these really harmful experiences from happening? And, um, and the response from the Title IX representative was that they had been given explicit instruction from the executives at BYU-Idaho that they were not to train the bishops, that that would be crossing into the priesthood uh, line. Um, and so I don't think I fully answered your question before. So the reason that this matters for Title IX is that if you can't get endorsed, you don't have access to the education, right? So this is absolutely a Title IX issue. Um, so that was really concerning to me that it was the impression of this member of the Title IX office that they had been instructed by the executive council at BYU-Idaho that they were to defer to the executives, as that's tantamount to the executives holding themselves above the law because title nine office has very specific guidelines from the federal government about how to operate with any of these kinds of concerns. So deferring to the executives means what it means that, that when it comes to, so even though title nine, the title nine office desperately wanted to give training to the ecclesiastical leaders to help mitigate this problem. 
the the executives told them they could not and they were instructed that they had to defer to the executives in this on this issue so so the title IX office wanted to train mormon bishops and state presidents about what sexual misconduct is as it relates to the endorsement process not as it relates to their role as bishop but endorsement is not a priesthood key endorsement <laughs> right endorsement is a is a power given to the bishops by the university and in the university handbook, it actually says that its final say rests with the academic vice president, although I would guess by now they've probably eliminated that from the handbook. Um, but um, the so endorsement is a university granted authority to these local leaders for the sake of expediency. Um, yeah. And so that's where the crux of this issue is, is if someone has to put up with being sexually harassed in order to get an endorsement, there's a problem. And the universe, uh, to my knowledge, BYU-Idaho has not done, certainly not sufficient systemic solutions, has not created sufficient systemic solutions to this problem in a way that would protect students. And I think it's really important, like parents need to know if you send your daughter to that campus and if she happens to get one of those bad apples as an ecclesiastical leader, she will have no recourse. None. What the, what, what the bishopric says goes. And so um, unless changes have been made that I'm unaware of, which is possible, but like I said, one of my sources over the weekend assured me that those changes had not been made. So... Um, I took these concerns. I sent letters to the accrediting body, to the, to the Office of Civil Rights. I don't know what's been done with that. I went to the press. No one picked up the story. I just feel like it's really important. I'm super worried about all of these students and my colleagues who continue to be held hostage. I mean, if they're so afraid of retaliation that they don't feel like they can speak about it, there's a huge problem here. And uh, like I said, my inclination, maybe if you'd have told me about this 10 years ago, I probably would have found ways of minimizing it. But I think once you've been pushed to the margins and you've experienced this abuse firsthand, you start believing people when they tell you these things are happening. And um, so I'm it's something I'm really concerned about. So just to reiterate, it appears as though, based on your experience, that the Mormon church did not want... Title IX officers at BYU-Idaho educating Mormon bishopric members and Mormon state presidency members about uh, how sexual harassment, sexual uh, abuse, any of that could uh, and should not interfere or intermingle with the ongoing ecclesiastical endorsement process. Correct. Did, did I state that? That's, that was my understanding. And like I said, that we ask very specific follow-up questions. I have a letter that I wrote to summarize it at the, because when we got that training, I was dumbfounded. I mean, it was like, wait a second, we can't, I mean, I knew the executives were, and, and, and to be clear, I have a, and I said this in the letters I wrote to the office of civil rights, I do have a conflict of interest because of my negative experience with this same council. So I'm totally open about that. Um, at the same time, these colleagues of mine are still really concerned and hurting and afraid, and they're still sharing these things with me. Well, you could and say so, that your experience, having experienced ecclesiastical abuse, spiritual abuse, actually qualifies you to, to speak on the behalf of, of other women and others who would be experiencing similar abuse. Instead of it being a conflict of interest, it I, might be a qualification. I I hope that's the case. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I certainly. But like I said, they have asked me to speak about this because they're too afraid of the retaliation that would come in their experience if they were to raise any more concerns. And, and let's talk really quickly. I, I, I think I alluded to this previously. You did get a job at UVU and you were able to move on mm -hmm. 
Talk about the employability or the non-employability, the attractability yeah. of a of a BYU Idaho faculty member when compared with a faculty member of other universities, kind of of a similar level that are secular. Sure, I had to fight <laughs> to stay relevant in my field because, um, and I was very lucky to have department chairs who were incredibly supportive all the way through of my creative uh, and professional development. And so largely because of their support uh, combined with my work ethic, I was because BYU Idaho is a teaching institution. You're expected to teach full time every semester in addition to doing some kind of um, professional development to stay relevant in your field. And as a result, there really are a lot of faculty members who just can't stay completely current in their field as professionals in their discipline. Um, just because of time. Just because of time, yeah. Just because of time. So um, so I, I fought really hard to make sure that I kept developing myself that way. And it was, a, it was, a, it was swimming upstream. So. so for a lot of these other staff and or faculty members, when they, when they go to another university at the same level and apply, what do you think the impressions are of the hiring bodies when they're looking at a, at a BYU Idaho faculty or staff member? I mean, it's not uncommon. I mean, this isn't the, this isn't the necessarily the norm, but it's not uncommon for faculty members to feel stuck at BYU Idaho because um, you know, when you are, when you're applying for a university job, they're basically, it's like, they're looking at three areas. They're looking at your service. They're looking at your teaching and they're looking at your research or creative interests. And, um, BYU Idaho faculty members on their resumes have tons of teaching and service, but it's really hard to keep your resume portfolio or your research portfolio competitive. It's probably the simplest way I could explain that. And then what about just BYU Idaho's BYU, the Mormon Church's reputation overall? There's a lot of bias against, you know, religious organizations or conservative religious organizations in general, but also Mormonism in particular. There's also a lot of perception out there that Mormonism is a bigoted religion, that Mormonism is a anti-LGBT religion, it's a racist religion, it's a sexist religion. Um can all of that, and then then there's just a perception that maybe the BYU's, especially BYU Idaho, just isn't very academically credible. Yeah, would all those things potentially play into the employability of someone who would otherwise want or need to leave BYU Idaho? The short answer is yes. The longer answer that I want to say, like out loud to the world or whoever's listening, is that. The faculty at BYU Idaho, by and large, are extraordinarily competent. Oh yeah, I feel like that. Oh yeah, the perception that they're somehow not as academically rigorous as is actually often not true. Um, more often than not, that is not true. Um, but that's because of their personal devotion to teaching and to their students and to their development, not because the culture, the, the administrative culture at BYU Idaho really is focused on teaching. And so um, it is an uphill battle for them. But I just want to say my colleagues up there are brilliant and remarkable practitioners of the fields that they teach by and large. Um, so, but that, but you're absolutely right that that perception creates challenges to leave. Um, I had to be very careful about making sure that my potential employers as I was applying elsewhere understood that I was an advocate for LGBTQ rights um, because I knew that would be an issue. Um, I've done writings that address how jazz, because I'm a jazz musician, and how jazz music actually was instrumental in kind of helping me um, fiercely and compassionately confront my biases with regards to race and um gender and sexuality and um, because it has been instrumental for me to when you hear something that moves you to your core as a human being and it's coming from you know, somebody who's who's gay or somebody who's you know it, cha it changes everything and so I've I've tried to be public about that in ways that would be 
um, acceptable on applications as evidence uh, of my hopefully evolving beyond the prejudice that I inherited. But that's a continual, that's an always thing for me. I have to keep my eyes out all the time for those kinds of thoughts and ideas coming up inside. Mm -hmm. So, so a lot of great faculty and staff, totally members, amazing. Um, but, but certainly an institution that would have a lot of uh, concern and bias uh, from the outside world that would then kind of amplify the problem of this ecclesiastical endorsement. Bishop Roulette sort of situation. Absolutely. Where it's one, it's, it's, it's bad enough that your career is tied to the, the roulette of a, a random Bishop member, Bishop that could be a dentist or he could be a plumber. He could be a used car salesman, not to offend any of those, you know, groups. It's just some random person. Not only is he affecting your career and potentially he could make decisions that are devastating to your career and your livelihood, but you're at an additional disadvantage of, of being in an institution where because of the nature and the structure of the institution, uh, it's even that much more difficult to, to find, to find jobs elsewhere. Yeah. I think that's accurate. Yeah. What if we have to speculate on why the church wouldn't just jump all over the Title IX office training bishops and state presidents about what is sexual harassment, what is sexual abuse, and why would they just not be all over that? Um, I, I don't think they know about it. What do you mean? That's my hope anyways. What do you mean? You mean I don't top think that I don't the, the top top. Yeah. When you get up to the like, I, I'm like the corporate I'm pretty con- the I'm, first presence. I'm fairly confident that when when Henry Iring, the younger meets with the board, he's not bringing up Title IX problems. Mm. I mean, there's a, like, you don't, you don't want to bring that image to yourself if you're the president of a university trying to put your best f- face forward. I don't, I think there's an inherent conflict of interest there. So the, le- to, in my mind, the likelihood of those reports actually making it all the way up are, is quite low. I think it's being stopped at the, okay. so I think it's BYU, Idaho. I mean, we've. They've made some very good changes in the wake of of the of the Tribune's story on BYU Provo. They made some very important changes. I know that the people who work in the Title IX office at BYU Idaho are amazing advocates for people they are safe to go to. Um, if you are a BYU Idaho student and you've experienced sexual misconduct firsthand, uh, you really can go to the Title IX office. They will help you. Um, but um, I don't think it's making its way past the executive council at BYU Idaho. So, so Henry Jr. doesn't doesn't talk to Henry Senior about about these sorts of things. Well, just to be to be super clear, you asked if we were speculating. That's yeah, yeah. speculation. Yeah. So I'm, I I I have no firsthand. And then, why do you think just the administrators of BYU Idaho wouldn't want? Do you have a, Do you have thoughts on why they wouldn't want? You know, surrounding bishops and state presidents well-trained on matters of sexual harassment and sexual abuse? Yeah, it, 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 I discussed this at length again with the vice president, and um, and I told him several times that this was going to really hurt people if they didn't make changes. Um, but really what it comes down to is they can't. I mean, and if I'm remembering our conversations accurately, he felt like they they simply could not question the priesthood line in any way, shape, or form. And so um, that was the line that they were drawing. So really it just is that that the most sacred thing in the Mormon church is the priesthood authority. I think is, th- is the priesthood hierarchy is the patriarchy. I think certainly at BYU Idaho that's accurate. It's, I mean that's that's been my experience across so the board and, and that really holly ties into your you know, your issues as well. It, it really is at the end of the day. Yeah. The church cares about Jesus. Yeah. The church cares about, you know, the atonement and Joseph Smith and eternal families. But when push comes to shove, if, if authority gets compromised, it, that's the frame that it's all built around. Cause if, if our prophets don't speak to God, if, if authority isn't, 
isn't true, isn't to fully respected, then where'd the Book of Mormon come from? Where did the Doctrine and Covenants come from? Was the church even divine to begin with? Why should we, li- if, why should we listen to the prophets now? Like, well, how are we any different from any other church that's just trying to do good? Like, I, I don't mean to be reductionistic, but really at the end of the day, everything is expendable if it if it's going against the patriarchy and, and, and church authority. Is that is that too extreme? I I feel like it can be reductive if what if by the church you mean the entire body of the church. Um well, I do I mean if we're talking about I mean the leadership. institutional yeah. leadership of the church, I think that that's large that in my experience that's largely accurate. Yeah. And but if we're talking about the body of the church, again, I just there are so many wonderful yeah practicing mormons who absolutely the center is not authority it's love right but to throw in my two two bits i think i think one my opinion one of the reasons that the um byu idaho the the administration uh support the bishops is if a bishop is a rotten apple, it's going to make them look bad because they're the ones, you know, down the line that called them and got inspiration. And so it makes everybody above them look bad if they've got a bishop who is... A bad apple. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so... And, and oftentimes... So these... you, you want to look good on paper. <laughs> unfortunately, not unfortunately, that's a common human thing. And it's very, I think they're... And oftentimes these bishops or stake presidents or whatever, they're, there's nepotism or there's, you know, business relationships or f- their family, their friends, their in-laws. I mean, just like Henry Small Iring town. Jr. <laughs> is the, it's, you know, is the son of Henry Iring Sr. Just like Matt Holland was the son of Jeffrey R. Holland. And we all know that the state legislature controls Utah Valley University and the state legislature is Mormon. So they're going to have an influence on who becomes president of Utah Valley University. Um, you know, th- there are relationships that, that also are going to weigh very heavily in these sorts of decisions, in addition to n- not wanting, you know, stake president inspiration to be, to be called into question. Um, so so it's it's problematic on a lot of levels. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I also imagine that they don't want this appellate, this option of an appellate process where everyone can sort of challenge their bishop. You know, who wants to administer, you know, word gets out that any student or faculty member or staff, if they don't get the endorsement, they can go through an appellate process mm. and that maybe the bishop's word can get overturned. Who wants to administer that, right? There's probably a lot of yeah. administration headaches, right? Then, then just that makes sense. Then, then don't use the bishops for the endorsement. It's a university power. Have the university endorse people, and then just like other places, have one alternative option if one says no. And then, you know, there are there definitely are solutions. They could have people in in positions to to help with those endorsements that had been fully trained about these tremendously important issues, which are hurting so many people. Yeah. They really could. It's, I I understand that it would be a little bit messy, but it's not as messy as somebody's life getting turned upside down. And, and if we're talking about lives being turned upside down, I'm guessing the number of faculty and staff who face these sorts of problems at, at the BYU's pales in comparison to the number of students who, if they get the wrong bishop and they admit that they masturbate or they admit that they pet, or if they just get turned in or someone suspects them of something or they're LGBTQ or whatever, they're feminist, or they have doubts, how many students are being harassed or intimidated or their education, even if they just have a sincere loss of faith, their, their educational you know, experiences, their time, their money, their mental health are all sort of being held hostage yeah. to this process, not from an employment perspective, but from an educational perspective. Absolutely. True? True. And I've heard people, you know, they've told me. Anyway, people, yeah, 
Former and yeah, students that have experienced that. Current and former. Yeah. Yeah. It's just this honor code thing is just is and the the nature of of ecclesiastical bishop roulette is so fraught. You know, it's yeah, so fraught. It really is. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else you want to say about about this? No, I think that's that's what I've got in me today to say. I hope some <laughs> of it was clear. I'm really I mean I just am so worried about my friends and students current and former and um because while if you go to BYU Idaho you will have like I said the most caring wonderful faculty who will really do everything they can to help those students there's a there's a toxic uh, culture there around the endorsement and around the administration that is definitely harming a lot of people. So I hope it changes. And that was part of why I decided to, to contact you and see if we could talk because I've tried every other venue that I know. And so maybe this will get some traction and people, maybe some parents can start calling and asking about this and, and helping helping that change move along. And so just to summarize, if you had a recommendation for BYU Idaho, the BYUs, the Mormon Church, do you have a some kind of a summarized set of recommendations? Um no, not off the top of my head. Nothing beyond what I've already spoken to. I, but there has to be a way to separate I mean if you are going to use the priesthood line for those endorsements then you are absolutely responsible for training them around these things. And if you're choosing not to train them, in my mind, you're a party to it, especially if you know that this is happening. Right. So. All right. So we've covered a lot of ground between <laughs> yesterday and today. What major sections do, do we have left for either of your stories? Like there's... Um, there's kind of your journeys since then with the church and out of the church. There's, you know, how your family's doing now and how you guys are each doing individually now. What, where do you guys want to go next? Or are you spent? <laughs> I, I like talking. I could talk all day. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I, I think as far as like where we're at now, we're still. Um, are there other parts of the story that you want to throw in or have no, you covered I think it? That, yeah, I think we got it. But, yeah. you know, we're still. In Utah, yeah, yeah, still not. Mormon. So you moved to Utah, you moved to Utah County. You're yeah. not. So that, that's you know. a thing, but but compare Utah County to Rexburg because some I think of Utah so County. Much more space. <laughs> What's that? I feel so much more space, and I think that our kids feel Why are you more laughing? space. <laughs> Which <laughs> is just like, funny that that is. I mean, some people look yeah. at Utah County as like the worst possible place for a liberal, progressive, yes. or post-Mormon. Uh -huh. And you guys are like gushing about how wonderful Utah County is compared to <laughs> Rexburg, which, which says a lot about Rexburg, right? Yes. So now, I'm sorry. No, so, so yes, yeah. so now say it. So. Well, anyway, yeah, just that we do feel more space. I think, and you know, and our <laughs> kids are still, we've only been here for about three years, so they're still... Anytime you move, they're still trying to get into the groove of it. But, you know, and they've all three have had a couple experiences, which is, is a bummer because it's still the majority religion. But I. But for you, leaving I Rexburg was like still what? Better, what was so it like better. to leave Rexburg? Um, and to come here. Yeah. Like so much a breath of fresh air <laughs> mm -hmm. and so much. Yeah. So much more space. And then going up to... All that harassment, all that monitoring, all that gossiping, oh, all that hometown yeah. stuff. You left all that, right? I did. And that, uh, yeah. And so now I'm here somewhere where nobody knows me. And so it's really nice to be able to have space to have people get to know me as me. Um, you know, for some degrees, you had an interesting experience with the bishop when we first got here that tracked us down but yeah someone's asking about ryan's faith journey and and what happened with you in the church after leaving byu yeah um so my was last, it hard to leave to leave byu idaho yeah are we happy to leave or? so hard to leave um i so i mentioned yesterday there have been two times that i can remember just being like racked with sobs and one of them was when they were doing the hiring process at byu idaho for my replacement um, I just, 
um, I got really concerned about some things in that process and I went in to talk to my chair about it and, um, and I just broke down crying because I was so worried about my students. I just wanted to make sure someone was really going to take care of them. And, uh, yeah, I just, and that chair of mine is, he's always been a friend who I just knew I could trust something deep inside me knows that I can trust him completely. And I think that's why it, I just lost it there. And, uh, and I went to my office right after that meeting with him and I was still just totally losing, like just truly grieving. And, um, and I went in my office and had this experience of, um, well, for the year before I had started writing a piece and only the first half of it would come and I would always get stuck halfway through. And then I, as I was grieving, leaving BYU, Idaho, and I went back to my office, like just something inside me said, you know, that tune we've been writing all year, this is why it's, it's time to finish it, sit down. And so I sat down at the piano and started playing. And every time I would find the right sound, it would like unlock more grief. And it was like the music was guiding me into these places of grief that I couldn't go into all by myself. Um, so now I want you to play that so, for us. <laughs> I haven't recorded it yet. We need to, that would be, I'll have to see what I can do. But, um, but I, so it was really hard to leave BYU, Idaho. And, um, and I love my colleagues and friends there and my former students so much. They were amazing. Through all of this craziness, my colleagues like formed a support group around us and our family and regularly invited us over. And we had awesome foodie nights. And the thing about Rexburg is if you live in Rexburg, like a lot of people learn how to really cook. So we ate some good food up there <laughs> with these friends of ours. Um, so um, it was really hard to leave. Uh, my last sacrament meeting in Idaho, I... I actually got up and bore my testimony and mm. just told everyone how sad it was to me, how my family had been treated. Wow. That's, that's direct. That's what I just left it right there with all of them. And I need to do that for me. I've stopped wanting, I don't say things to change others anymore at all. Um, but I've learned that there are things that I have to speak out loud for my own well being, And so that was one of those. And then, um, after we anyone were, come up and apologize yeah, or comment? A lot of people. What did people say? Of, just an outpouring of love, largely. Mm, that's nice. Um, it was really nice. Yeah, and and apologies, and um, we <laughs> we had a good crew show up to help us move and load the truck. Um, that's nice. <laughs> maybe out of <laughs> a little bit of guilt, but um, uh, but that was the last time I've been to church, and I haven't been back since. <laughs> 